to organizing hundreds of public readings across Canada of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol as fundraisers, to leaving the CBC and working full time at recording people's life stories. I stand before you as someone who is still trying to figure out how I fit. What is my meaning? We constantly redefine who we are, what we can offer, all based on what we have learned, what we have tried, and what is needed. And redefining is a good thing. I invite you to think of your time here when you were not in class. What were your interests? Who did you hang out with? What gave you great joy? What did you learn wasn't your bag? There are clues in those answers. Be open to using more than the degree you gained here. Think about sharing in some way who you are and what you know with the people in your community. Looking at my own learnings and activity at U of G and seeing where my life path has led, I know now that I kept coming back to what nourished me. It was 10 years from when I wrote to the CBC to when they hired me. I find it fascinating that I just came back to what I wanted to do. And I think though you'll find your process, the pathway is weird, you'll get there. Things have a way of working out. The truth is, as we all know, that only in the doing, only in the doing is it that we learn what we're good at. There's no theory. It's all practical. As a kid on a hockey team, you maybe learned you were great in defense, not so great as a forward. Or you could dive. Or you drew some great cartoons. Whatever it was you enjoyed, you enjoyed by doing, and you got better at it by doing. My professional career has been focused on storytelling in news journalism. I got pretty good at it. I got pretty good at getting up at 3.30 every morning. As long as my husband didn't speak to me, he lived. <laughs> you laugh, but that's the truth. <laughs> My job as the host of World Report was fascinating. It was new every day. I had stories about economies, wars, the environment, health issues, education, and crime, surrounded by good stories. But sometimes it's hard to understand the impact because there's no reference to real people and to the import of a particular issue in our lives. The stories don't always touch my heart, and I don't think they touch the hearts of listeners. Every day I reported some statistic or other. The number of dead, the number infected by a virus, the number of unemployed, the number of students affected by the double cohort some years ago, or the number of homeless. Don't you love that word, the homeless? Them, not us. I try always to say homeless people. So statistics can make me glaze over even though as a broadcaster I always sounded really enthusiastic about them. But I'd like to take a look at how stories, stories again are really important here, how they make numbers mean something. The number of dead, let's take Haiti. We heard that 200,000 people died, 1.5 million were made homeless, 7,000 military peacekeepers, 180 tons of relief supplies flown in one day. Those are big numbers. Very hard to comprehend. But break it down to the people, and we begin to relate to the devastation. We wonder how we would feel and cope. The pregnant couple standing outside their home where their two-year-old son is trapped. A 16-year-old girl rescued after being buried for five days in the rubble of a three-story building. People gathering at night on the sidewalks of Port-au-Prince with candles, then later in the darkness, singing. A little eight-year-old boy begging for food for his baby sister. No idea where his parents are. The stories give shape and meaning to the numbers. They make those people real. As the Canadian author Thomas King says, the truth about stories is that all we are. And stories keep people we loved and bygone times alive for us all. So that's my focus and my profession now, helping people record their life stories. I call it really 
private radio. These are hour-long conversations edited, put on a CD, accompanied by an album of pictures, stories of the birth of a new baby, adventure, a teenager paddling across northern Ontario, stories of the Second World War, the Depression, stories of achievement, stories of great sorrow, of great love, of great passion. So returning to my theme of we're not constrained by our degrees, I want to tell you a few stories I've been privileged to record about the lives of people who were not constrained by some kind of challenge. For instance, a boy who was born at the beginning of the Second World War in Italy on a farm, desperate to join his father and his brother in Toronto so he could make some money and buy a car. At the age of 14, he got on a ship by himself, landed in Montreal, and he told me the trip from Montreal to Toronto passed by wonderful parking lots full of wonderful cars. His dream might come true. He arrived, he went to work the next day in a lumber yard. He's now very successful in the lumber business. For instance, Alexander was born in 1923 into a Jewish family in Romania, the youngest, the only boy and six children. As a teenager, he set out to Budapest to see more of the world. He found work, but then Hungary fell to the Germans, and eventually Alex experienced life in two concentration camps. Using his wits and his ambition, he survived terrible conditions. After the war, he worked with the U.S. Army beginning in KP, then moved on to catering. Using those connections, he and his wife came to Canada. He founded a successful business and raised and educated three sons who contribute to Canadian society. For instance, a young Ontario woman whose father had a risky job. He built and repaired steeples. Sometimes he took her up the steeple with him. She finished high school, then had more than a few bumps and difficult times. She was widowed twice, had two children to raise alone, but she took a risk. She used what she'd learned in various jobs, and now she has a thriving business, and she's loved and respected by the people she employs. For instance, a friend of mine fell off a horse when he was about 10, and the horse stepped on his wrist so badly that he lost the use of his arm from his elbow to his fingertips. He earned a degree, learned to do anything he wanted. He skied, played golf, tennis, he plays golf, tennis. He hung wallpaper, try and imagine doing that. He diapered babies. He's now the executive director of an organization helping people with disabilities. Now, these people in the stories I've just told weren't constrained by what I would call their degrees. They were all challenged by difficult times. But they all built on several things. Determination, making connections with others, taking risks, doing what they loved, and caring for the people in our world. So while achieving a degree at the University of Guelph is difficult, and you are all facing one degree or another of penury, possibly a few more years of craft dinner. The world is full of possibility. So though you may have a degree in history, you are not uh, necessarily destined for teaching history or writing it. I have a daughter who's working with dogs, thank you very much. She's happy. Though you may have a degree in veterinary medicine, you are not necessarily going to open a small animal clinic. Though you may have a degree in English, you are not necessarily going to write novels. But you are further along the road to seeing which path looks most fascinating. You have honed skills by doing, and you have a degree which adds to and informs your essence. The talents and abilities and interests that were there before your post-secondary education. I think now you know you can do it. Now you know you can take on a challenge and get through it, even soar on from it. From it. Now you are in charge. You have been given a gift, and now you get to share it.
Thank you.